Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. This is Joanne McGurn uh, Hamburg with the Real Estate Exchange. And thank you for joining us for our webinar on Mobile Homes 101. Um, today, I'm lucky to have with me Sean Rogers with Sterling Associates. And I'd like to introduce Sean. And if you could tell us a little bit about yourself, Sean, and uh, how long you've been with Sterling Associates and doing manufactured home financing, that would be great. Sure. Uh, I started in the manufactured housing financing industry back in 1990 after I graduated from college. Um, my first 15 years were with Forward Financial Company. Um, they used to be the, the dominant player in the, in the industry. Um, in 2005, uh, they were sold from Boston Federal Savings to uh, Bank TD Bank, or Bank North at the time, I think it was called. And... At that point, I was uh, my non-compete clause was up, and I could cut my own deal anywhere I wanted. So, I went to Sterling Associates. Um, so, I think that was in August of two thousand and five, and I've been with Sterling since. Um, Sterling is a wholly owned subsidiary of Unibank for Savings. Uh, Unibank is a, I think, the largest lender in the Blackstone Valley of Massachusetts, just below Worcester. Um, it's a $2 billion bank, so it's a decent sized bank. It's got 12 branches and Sterling originates and sells, uh, about 430 million in primarily boat loans, but about 30 million in manufactured housing loans. So we originate, uh, and close and fund about 30 million in manufactured housing every year and sell them off to four or five client lenders, including Unibank, our parent lender. Wow. Um, and if anyone has any questions during the recording, please feel free to type them in the chat box on the right, and um, we'll try to answer them uh, at the end, right before we sign off. So a lot of things with manufactured homes, um, you and I have talked about previously, but you know, one of the big things is in 1976, manufactured homes became uh, certified, they had to pass a certain construction standard. So they came out with a HUD certification. Um, the HUD manufactured home construction standards were passed on June 15, 1976. This certificate had to apply to each transportable section. So if you had a two-piece manufactured home or a double wide, each section would have a little metal data plate on the back of the home with the HUD certified number that the mobile home or manufactured home has been inspected um, and, and meets the building standards for the Federal Manufactured Home and Construction Safety Standards Act. Um, how has that affected your company with lending with homes? I know some companies won't do any homes older than 1976. They have to be HUD certified. I think you have a couple lenders that might loan on a little bit older home. Yeah, I've got one lender currently uh, that'll go beyond 76. And, and th that 76, that June 15th date, is just a, um, I don't know, it's like a Mason-Dixon line, so to speak, or whatnot. But it's a, it's a comfort level for a lot of lenders saying, oh, they were built to a certain specification on that date. So that's when we're going to start lending. Um, I've got one lender, um, not in your area, more so down in southeastern Mass, that will lend uh, 1970 in newer. Um, and like I, you know, I'm trying to convince some of the other lenders to go back that far, but you know, I'm I'm doing a 19, I did a 1978 for 238,000 in a co-op down in Plymouth, so they're you know 800 credit scores and 40 percent down. It's a good loan. Why not do it? You know what I mean? Yeah. And the the the, the collateral is in very good shape. So a lot of it has been rehabbed and updated and so on and so forth. So um, the lender said, yeah, sure, we can do that. And they do do it, but um, a few of the other lenders, not so much. So they want to start at 76 and go up from there, um, which I'm trying to talk them into going back a little to, a little further. But uh, for the time being, um, 76 and newer, I can do. I need, I think, 20 to 30% down for built in the 70s. And then uh, I can do 15% down 80 to 90. And then 90 and newer, I can do as little as 10% down. So really depends on the age of the unit um, and it's a comfort level thing with the lenders and 
you know, some of the lenders aren't, don't really understand the business as much as you or I may, may understand the business. So they just, oh, well, you know, I read online, I should only do 1976 newer. So that's what we're going to do. And I'm like, well, it's, you're missing out on quite a bit of opportunity here to, to lend to good people on good homes and good communities. So um, I, I can in certain areas go back far, but unfortunately in the Fitchburg, uh, uh, Lemonster area, I well, cannot Worcester. go. Yeah. Or Worcester, I cannot go back that far. It's only certain towns um, that are within the, the lending range of this credit union that's in in, uh, in Southeastern Mass. Yeah. What are you looking at for finance terms, like timelines? Like I know yeah, you so, you're looking at anywhere from 20 to 10 percent down. So yeah. So I um, I can do as little as 10 years, 10 to 12 years on the old 1970s uh, units. I can go 20 years of those built in the 80s and up to 25 years for 90 and newer. That's pretty good. 25 years for a manufactured home. That's yep. Yep. And then currently um, tip, typically rates have been, you know, anywhere from two to 3% above mortgage rates. Um, I've got a closing tomorrow in Maine with 50% down. The rate is six and a half percent, which is lower than the mortgage rate. So it's, it's a great rate right now. So um, the, the, the spread of where my rates are compared to mortgage rates has always been fairly large. And right now it's negligible. Um, what mortgage states, rates are at 7%. What states are you loaning in then currently? And obviously Mass, New Hampshire, Maine. Connecticut and Rhode Island as well. Oh, that's great. Um, what about closing costs? You know, like we both do Mass and New Hampshire. I don't do Maine or Rhode Island. It's a little far for me to drive. Um, but what do you look at like with closing costs versus mass versus New Hampshire and appraisal fees and stuff? Yeah, closing costs in mass are very minimal as it's considered personal property. Um, there's not a lot to it. There's an appraisal fee of 400 for our appraiser. There's a doc prep fee that we charge for 495 to do all the work and get to the closing. Um, and then the bank, um, depending on the rate, may require you to escrow your insurance. If that's the case, it'll ask for probably two months worth of insurance to go to get the escrow uh, account going. Um, that's it. No attorney's fees, um, no points, no application fee. Um, you know, we don't charge to pull your credit. We don't charge to, you know, try to make it as inexpensive as possible. And um, well, I mean, it sounds like about fifteen fifteen hundred $1,500, you'd have all your closing costs covered. If, if that, in Massachusetts, yeah. if that, because the, usually the, the, the insurance is going to run you probably about 200 bucks. To, for deposit, so it's not that bad. In New Hampshire, however, um, it is the only state in the union that considers these manufactured homes in parks real estate. And as a result, uh, they are closed as real estate with title companies or attorneys. There are transfer stamps, except for on a brand new home, which are $15 per thousand, uh, split evenly by the buyer and the seller. Um, but if, as you know, with the price of homes today, if you're doing a $200,000 home, your transfer stamps add up pretty fast. Um, so I generally tell folks in New Hampshire, closing costs run about $1,800 uh, plus transfer stamps and escrows. Um, and the 1800 would cover your attorney's fees, your, your appraisal, your doc prep, um, your recording costs at the registry of deeds and whatnot. Um, but they're actually conveyed by a warranty deed like you would have on a regular house in, in either Madison or New Hampshire. Still very reasonable compared to purchasing a traditional home, your closing costs are a lot less. And so instead of paying money towards closing costs, you can apply that towards your down payment, which I think is really great. Um, yep. can, can the seller pay the buyer's closing cost? Is there a fee, an amount that they're allowed to pay for closing cost? The buyers can pay closing costs, not a problem if it's negotiated with the, with the purchase. What they can't do is assist with the down payment. Because the down payment, assisting with the down payment would be really a, a reduction in sale price. So um, that that's a no-no as far as the bank's concerned. Um, but as far as uh, any of the closing costs, the seller is more than welcome to help the buyer with the closing costs if that facilitates the deal. Yeah. One of the other items that comes up quite a bit is say we have a manufactured or a mobile home that you know could use some new rugs, new appliances, you know something like that, and the seller says, hey. Um, I'll credit you ten thousand dollars for repairs and updates. Um, how is that normally handled? And obviously, how would that apply in uh, for a loan? Again, again, the lender doesn't want to see that those funds going back to the buyer because it looks kind of like uh, an assistance with the down payment. 
So what they would prefer to do would be have those funds go to a third party, ABC Appliance, ABC Home Improvement, um, mm -hmm. whoever is going to do the work. And we could cut those funds right at the proceeds, uh, right, right at the closing to that third party that's so going to do all the work. And so we can we do just it. need like an invoice. We, Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Yeah, we could we could do that, or we could even we could even do uh, two checks to that same third party, half to get going, and half on, on, upon completion. If that if that's what um, people negotiate and, and make it work for them, so um, that would be fine. But it, it just giving money back to the buyer is kind of a red flag, so to speak, with the lender. It just seems like the the buyer doesn't have the appropriate down payment and they're trying to skirt that issue. So um, sellers are more than welcome to pay for some, some home improvements, but it's going to have to be through a third party and, and paid directly by us or the seller. Oh, that's great. Well, that's good to know. I didn't realize, honestly, I've done a ton of these, as you know, and I didn't realize that that would be the best way to handle it. That's usually what we end up doing. We have the seller just prepay, but if the yep. bank's willing to cut the checks, obviously that would make it a lot easier. Yep. Um, you know, we're always adjusting for park rent and uh, utilities. That's usually done right through the mortgage company. What happens if, say, we have an appraisal done and the home doesn't appraise? Um, how do you guys normally handle that? I mean, what have you seen? Yep, that hasn't happened very often over the last five or seven years because of the increased values of the, of the units. However, um, I think we're kind of capping out. I think, I don't know. Um, it's happened a couple times this year already. Um, and typically, uh, depending on the down payment amount, if there's a large enough down payment, sometimes the bank won't care because their loan to value is still sufficient to make them happy. Um, however, sometimes, for example, if you're buying a home for 150,000 and putting 10% down and the home only appraises at 145,000, well, the lender's only going to lend, um, cause they want that 90% loan to value for their loan. They'll do 90% of the 145 instead of the one, instead of the 150. So, uh, either the buyer has to come up with the additional down payment or they got to negotiate the price down to the 145, um, that the, the buyer and seller agree. Okay. Um, this is what we're going to do. And, and many times um, there'll be a clause in the purchase and sale anyways that says who must appraise at or, at or above agreed upon sale price. So that kind of protects the buyer anyways. Um, not something the seller likes to, to, to see, but on the same token, you know, whether it's a house or a car or anything else, if, if it's only worth X, you don't want to pay X plus Y because it's, yeah. it's just, you don't, no one wants to get a bad deal. You know what I mean? So we as a result, it's, what's yeah. fair is fair, so to speak. Absolutely. We usually end up negotiating and I think most realtors end up doing the same, you know, just going back and trying to work something that makes everybody happy. You know, we talked a little bit about uh, recording in New Hampshire and I've had many people ask me over the years, well, don't I have to pay excise tax on the manufactured home in mass? And there really are no recording fees in massachusetts um no the only guys... the only recording they have so the bill of sale doesn't get recorded anywhere so as a result uh, i've always done two bills of sale so the buyer will leave the closing with an original bill of sale that they can keep with their car title or any other kind of important papers they have around the house um the only recording that's being done for us anyways is going to be the lien which is a ucc or uniform commercial code statement that gets recorded at the secretary of state's office so um Nothing to get recorded as far as that's concerned. But in the event, and I always tell folks at the closing, in the event that you lose um, your bill of sale, typically your lender will have a copy and the realtor will have a copy. And a lot of times when you move into the park, they want a copy as well to prove that you are in fact the new owner of the home. So um, it's, it's an important document, um, but um, it's something that we make a lot of copies of. So there's other people to, to find it because again, not being recorded anywhere. Um, it's a little bit of the wild west, but yeah, um, they can easily pass be around enough coffee, coffee. So people, in the event you do lose your, your bill of sale, there's enough out there that we can, we can find another one. Hopefully we've had many where unfortunately we've tried to do UCC searches, try to see if we can find anything. We've gone back to insurance companies. 
uh, there's only so many ways you can identify an actual manufactured home. Um, a lot of times they'll have um, a manufactured specification sheet that will have the make, model, and serial number on it. Um, we've had a few cases we'd have to actually take the skirting off the front of the home and get the number off the uh, I beams. So, yep. um, so here's a, here's so, a new one. I just I ran into this yesterday, and I had no idea this existed. There's actually a website out there. Um, I'm dealing with a, a home that was rehabbed. It's in Wareham, and the HUD seal, HUD sticker, I guess you'd call it, the data plate. Um, was removed from the home and we couldn't identify the year, the make or the serial number of the unit. So hmm, what are we gonna do? So I made a couple phone calls. I'm dealing with some folks that have been in the business for 50 years. And he said, as a matter of fact, it has. And there's a website where you can take a picture of the HUD seal on the back of the unit and you can, for a fee, and it's the, the faster you want it, the more you're going to pay. But it's between this hundred dollars depending on how much pay. You can put the HUD UL number into this website and pay the fee, and they'll tell you the manufacturer, the date of manufacture, and the serial number. Amazing! I need that. Never knew it existed. <laughs> I didn't know that existed either. And I, like I said, I've done a lot just of happened, Just happened to me yesterday. Just happened oh. to me yesterday. And I'm like, how do I, how did I not know this before that? But I didn't know it. And now we do. So yeah. crazy. Well, you, I, I, you definitely I, I couldn't, that. the appraiser, yeah, the appraiser couldn't appraise the home because they couldn't figure out how old it was. They, they, it's hard to be a comp when you don't know what you're comparing it to. Um, and we managed to solve that today. Wow. Well, you're going to have to share that one with me because I do not have that. And I've talked to many old timers and nobody's ever heard of that. So that's why I said we've had to take skirting off to find yeah. the serial number to at least have some kind of identification to go with because it's difficult. just the UL number on, on the HUD seal in the back of the home on that red tag. Yeah. You have that, you're good to go. Well, you know, on some of the old ones, they have these little silver tags. Yep. And it has a number on it, which you know, I think was it was red, but it faded. Yeah, it probably <laughs> was. That's pretty cool. But I definitely want that information. We'll have to share it with our viewers too afterwards. Um, you know, since we're talking about that, what about like the differences between a traditional mobile home park and a co op? You know, um, you work in both communities. We do. Um, we, we work in either or. I don't really find much of a difference between the two. Um, I've had great experience with co-ops. I've had great experience with uh, privately owned um, uh, parks. How, mm -hmm. However, um, I've had bad experience with both as well. So, um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily one's better than the other, although um, the co-op um, Rock USA group will tell you that co-op's the way to go because it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, I, don't, I don't really differentiate either way because I've seen some co-ops that are poorly run and that happens. But there's also some regular um, private parks that are poorly run as well. So um, I think it really depends on the park um, and the people that run it. You know, are they, are they around? Do they put money back into the park? Do they try to keep it making look, look nice and, and, you know, and when it snows, are the roads nice and clean, or do they, is there an effort on their behalf? Yeah. Um, Absolutely, so, so, landlords, we don't like those too much. Yeah, I mean, some parks are, are in real nice shape because the, the landlords are they're there all the time. Other ones, um, you probably never, you don't even know who the park owner is sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, you know, if a park, if you have a park and you sell it to the residents, the residents don't know how to run a park either. So it's a live and learn kind of, you know, trial and error. You, you learn as you go kind of thing. And you know, they're, they're um, given some help by Rock USA as far as how to do it. Um, doesn't mean it's always done right. So um, I don't, either way, I, I don't really care um, whether the park is, is a resident owned community or it's privately owned. Um, as you well know now, I think in both Mass and New Hampshire, if the park's gonna be sold, the residents have first right refusal anyways. Um, and if, if the residents can afford it and, and 
do that, that's great. But as you well know, um, these parks aren't going to close because they're they're worth too much as manufactured home parks to close. So the, the fear of a Walmart coming in and wiping the park out so they can build, build a Walmart, that's not going to happen. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a lot a of people that, will say, well, what if they that, sell the park? What am I going to do? God, that happens. I, like you and I were talking about, what was it, uh, Robert Kraft? Was that yep. who was, yeah, he bought a park and he put up the stadium. You know, so he owned the park. He, he owned Foxborough Stadium that came with Horseman's Trailer Park behind it. And there were 68 units in there. And when he built the new uh, Gillette Stadium, he closed the manufactured home park, but he had to give it a two year notice, one and two, he had to pay every resident the full appraised value of their unit, not a book value or not $3,000 each, like 80 grand, 90 grand, 110 grand. Mm -hmm. And then he took the homes and he sent them to Israel as, as a write off uh, for folks to use. But um, that doesn't happen. That's the only one I've heard of in the 33 years of doing this. Um, because the, the parks, they're profitable business to be in, whether you own it privately or the residents own it. Um, but that being said, costs do go up. Your taxes go up. Your water bill goes up. Your snow plowing goes up. So as a result, um, you know, your sure. rent's going to go up because yeah, the insurance. costs are costs. Everything goes up. Yep. yep. I mean, you know, the um, park approval part and the part for financing, what do you guys require like for credit score, um, debt to income ratio, that kind of stuff? What, what do yep. you guys do for? First and foremost, the home's got to be owner occupied. We're not going to let you do uh, buy a manufactured home and rent it out to um anybody or your your children or anything of that nature it's owner occupied only um one um two the, the lender is going to look for a credit score in the 660 670 area um sometimes if the credit score is there um and there's a really like a lot of bad credit on the on the report uh the lender can still say no because of what they see on that report sometimes um if it's a little bit lower but it's clean um, the lender will do it and the, and the down payment is 20 or 25 percent the lender might go a little bit lower than normally would um, but generally um, 660 670 credit score debt ratio depends that varies from lender to lender um, most lenders are 42 43 percent or below all in um, for fixed debt not like cell phone bills and things like that but car payments and lot rent and, and your manufactured home payment um, some of the banks go, I've got one that goes to 48, um, but the term is a little bit lower than the 25 years of the newer stuff. So it kind of balances everything out as far as that's concerned. Um, but it's, it really, it varies from lender to lender, but as a reason, for the most part, about 660 plus, again, it depends what the credit looks like. Cause I've got seven tens that got declined because they were laid on their mortgage three years ago, seven times. So um, it really depends what the credit looks like versus uh, the, an actual sort of line in the sand as far as the score is concerned. Yeah. And do you guys do a pre-approval or how do you work with that? So if we have a buyer that wants to go out looking, obviously I don't want to just jump in my car and take them out looking where they not, don't have any qualified. idea what the credit is or they're yep. qualified. Um, yep. So, what do so you we, don't do an act, we don't actually do a pre-call. We actually do a pre-approval. So we'll have you apply for a specific home. Um, one that you might be interested in. We'll get you approved for that home. And then you can sh they can show you that approval and say, hey, look, uh, Sean says we're good for this loan of 120,000. Here's our rate, here's the term. It's proof of income and an appraisal. Um, let's go shop. And that'll, that'll make you feel comfortable about, okay, these people aren't just kicking tires. They're not, uh, uh, they're qualified. They are qualified to buy something. And let's see if we can find a, a home that they like. Awesome. What about a um, mobile home on its homeland? We get lots of not... calls. Everybody thinks it's the golden egg to buy a mobile home on its own land. And it's just, I find they're very hard to finance. And uh, it's, or they want to build a brand new mobile home on a piece of land, which is almost impossible because most of the towns will not allow manufactured or um, mobile homes on a piece of land, but they will allow yeah. a module. I think the bigger problem, and at least in Massachusetts, it's probably more common in New Hampshire and 
much more common in Maine to have a manufactured home on its own land. But Massachusetts, an acre of land is going to cost you 150000 So putting a manufactured home on it, it doesn't really make sense because the, the, it's more of a land loan than it is a, a land home loan, so to speak. You're better off building a house there than putting a manufactured home on it. That being said, there are so few of them in Massachusetts that there's not really a market for it. So as a result, there's not a marketplace that you can really lend for them because nobody really does it as far as I know. Yeah, no, it's difficult. We've had a few. We've been lucky. Um, I mean, Athol Credit Union and sometimes the local lender, like we had one in uh, Shirley and the local lender, um, yeah. Main Street Bank ended up doing, you know what I mean? So, yep. but most of the time they're either cash buyers um, and some of these mobile homes are really nice. It's just, it's, you know, it's tough that there isn't a market for that, but I yep. guess personal loan or something like that. Um, again, if anyone has any questions, we're going to be wrapping up here in a couple minutes. I think that I've asked most of the things I can think of. What do you think, Sean? Is there anything that you think we should add? Um, oh, the other thing is your application is available right online. Right online. Our website is MH, as a manufactured home, mhbanker.com. You can find our current rates there um, and other items. My email, my cell phone, everything else is on there. Um, in case someone has a question, they can always email or call me. Um, that's easy. Um, other things, as far as verifying ownership, that's something we haven't discussed earlier. Generally, we get a copy of that bill of sale. So, if you're going to sell me a, a manufactured home, uh, and I'm going to, or I'm going to, someone's going to sell you one, and I'm going to get a copy of the bill of sale of the person that's selling it that was into them. That way, I can prove that they are in fact the owner of the part uh, of the unit. Um, so that's when something so that's something we hadn't discussed earlier that but we thought yeah. about discussing. Yeah, and in New Hampshire there would be a copy of a deed. But like yeah. you were mentioning, you know, one of the things sometimes they get lost. So I really want to get that link for that website because we've had a few times that that's been difficult. And you know, sometimes we end up with like probate deals, and those yep. can take a while. What do you need for probate paper? Just a copy of the appointment of the person. Yeah, the the appointment. Um, the, luckily, I think with COVID, sometimes I got one that went through very quickly last year. Um, I don't know if they knew somebody in the court system or what, but like three weeks they had somebody appointed and saying like a special dispensation to sell the manufactured home, which was great to allow us to close really fast, which is, you know, as, as you well know, probate sometimes can take four or five, six months. Um, or well, longer. Could, we had yeah. one that was a... It was a tough one, but it was a lot of weird circumstances with it. Um, we do have someone who's asking a little more about Rock USA um, and how that works, where that's- Okay, so, yep. So Rock USA is Resident Owned Community USA is what it stands for. It's uh, part of the arm of the Community Loan Fund, which uh, is out of Concord, New Hampshire, and they assist residents in purchasing the manufactured homes uh, from the private owners. So uh, for example, like we said earlier, Massachusetts and New Hampshire, um, the residents have first right of refusal. So when the residents are, are notified that they uh, have the option or the right to buy the, the park, um, they'll contact Rock USA, Rock USA gets involved and they'll assist them as far as getting organized, getting the loans together um, and getting enough people on board, you got to have 50% of the folks in the park on board in order to, uh, to, to go co-op, so to speak. So as long as 50% of the people will do it, or 51, I think might be, yeah. um, you can go co-op. Um, and Rock USA is an arm of community loan fund that will assist the residents to make that happen. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's quite, there's, um, well, like Greenville Estates is a co-op park in New Hampshire. There's another one in New Ipswich. Or oh, there, there, I think there's 127 in New Hampshire right now. They, yeah, that is they the way that really, most of them are going. They really, um, they started doing it in 1984 and it really picked up steam. I want to say in around 2004, 2005, um, to the point where pretty much 90, 90, 95% of the parks are being sold, um, the residents are buying, which yeah. again, can be a good thing, uh, can be a bad thing if you're paying too much and you're not organized. So 
Um, Rock USA does a pretty good job um, of organizing the folks. They do kind of scare them to saying you better buy it because it's going to be a Walmart if you don't, you're not have any place to live, which as we discussed earlier, isn't really, I, I wouldn't go there as far as that's concerned. Um, but they're a good group. They, they assist the folks to, to buy the park. And um, it's, it seems like it's a system that, that for the most part, again, for the most part, uh, works pretty well in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Yeah, one of the things that's you know good about being a co-op park is they actually have an opportunity to control any repairs, control how much the rent is going to go up or down. Um, we have one at the park in Greenville. They're been a co-op for a long time, and they actually paid off one of their mortgages and brought their rent down for the residents. Yep. Um, but over the years now, they pay their own water, they pay their own sewer bills, so things have changed yep. over the years from what they originally were. So, you know, that's been pretty good. And then there's a community in Shirley that's a co-op. So uh, co-ops can be nice. Um, you know, um, manufactured home communities are very popular in New England. There are a lot of people looking to buy one in this area. So when you own a park, everybody reaches out to buy it from you. So you never know. I have one. You never know. Someday I might want to sell it, but not yet. Um, yeah. But again, I, I'd like to thank you for joining us, Sean. I know you didn't quite make it home. You had to pull over and uh mcdonald's parking lot so you could join us but i really appreciate it and if anyone's looking to do mortgages or help a buyer get pre-approved please check out mhbanker.com for sterling associates and sean rogers and uh, we will send everybody the link for the website for the hud ul url numbers so that if you ever get stuck you'll be able to look that up and the other thing we'll send out is the link so that you can do a uc search, which is the Uniform Commercial Code, so that you can do a search to make sure there's no liens on the property when you close. Um, but yep. always go with a trusted advisor who understands manufactured homes because they are a unique purchasing opportunity and a great opportunity for many home buyers. It's, in many cases, less expensive than renting. So again, thank yeah. you. We call it specialized lending because um, not many folks do it. So it's it's kind of a specialty, um, but we're good at it. We've done it for a long time and happy to help folks. Thanks. Absolutely. We're going to have another um, webinar coming up on manufactured homes, more legal end of it. So please keep an eye out for our next webinar. And again, thank you, Sean. Thank you for everybody who joined us and have a wonderful week, guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.